Well, it. Okay. Uh, well, uh, hello. I'm David Geo, visiting professor of intelligence and international security here in the Department of War Studies at King's College London. And on behalf of the KCL Cybersecurity Research Group and the Army Cyber Institute at West Point, thank you very much for registering for this event on defeating coercive information operations in future crises. I'm thrilled to have Dr. Paul Stockton, the paper's author, and he's joined by Captain Dr. Maggie Smith and Major Joe Littell of the Army Cyber Institute at West Point as discussants. I'll start off with some introductions and then give Paul the microphone for about 20 minutes to lay out his paper's key arguments. Uh, then I'll turn the microphone over to Maggie and Joe for a collective 10 minutes or so for feedback and discussion on Paul's presentation. Then I'll give Paul the opportunity to uh, reply to Maggie and Joe's uh, points and, and reaction before opening the floor to the audience for some questions. Uh, please do put your questions in the chat box and I will try to uh, moderate those and, uh, and pass them along. Okay, our panelists. Dr. Paul Stockton is a senior fellow of the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab and was Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and America's Security Affairs during the Obama administration. He holds a PhD from Harvard University and his full bio can be found on page 199 of the report that he authored, uh, which is linked in the Zoom registration page. So you can find it there. Our discussants, Dr. Maggie Smith is an active duty army officer serving as a researcher on the Army Cyber Institute's Information Advantage Team. She's also assistant professor in the Department of Social Sciences. Major Joe Littell is also an active duty Army officer on the uh, Information Advantage team as well. He's a psychological operations officer and holds a graduate degree from Duke University. He teaches the uh, Academy's most popular interdisciplinary course on intelligence and cyber operations. Uh, so let me turn it over to Paul and I will go ahead and drive Paul's slides. So Paul, over to you. David, thanks so much to you and to everybody who's participating today to take a little time to think differently about information operations than we typically would. And that gets me to my uh, first slide, David, if you wouldn't mind. So let's level set here. Uh, I've stolen this definition from the US uh, Joint Staff and tried to civilianize it, if you will. This is the way I'd like to have us understand information operations uh, for the purposes of today. You'll notice that there's both an offensive and a defensive component to information operations. We'll primarily be talking today about how to play defense while still upholding the United States Constitution. Not an easy thing to do. Next slide, please. We're all familiar with the ongoing Chinese and Russian campaigns happening today uh, to corrode the faith of the American people uh, in their own government, to convince them that uh, COVID isn't really a serious disease, but most recently, that US government policies regarding COVID are corrupt and useless. So these are ongoing campaigns. We face them every day. My focus today is talking about the crises to come in the Taiwan Straits, little green men pouring across the border from Russia into the Baltics, these intense edge of war crises that might actually go over the edge. I wanna focus on the use of information operations in these incredibly tense situations. The goal that adversaries are gonna have is to convince the American people and US decision makers and allied decision makers in the case of NATO, that the costs of living up to our defense commitments are not worth, but rather the benefits of living up to our defense commitments are not worth the costs that we'll pay in terms of the incredible punishment that our citizens are gonna suffer when adversaries use cyber capabilities to disrupt the flow of power, cut off water service, everything else on which modern life 
uh, depends. If these threats of punishment prove inadequate to drive our behavior, then adversaries will make good on those threats and begin conducting cyber attacks, begin displaying their capabilities to disrupt life, and then, of course, threaten more punishment to come unless our leaders yield. Next slide, please. Let me give you the key findings of the study. First of all, when there is a crisis, the US public turns to social media to an extraordinary extent as a source of its information. And China and Russia have all kinds of capabilities now to exploit that dependence and turn it to their advantage to help shape public perceptions, beliefs, and behavior. And what's most critical to understand is that even small scale events now can be leveraged by adversaries to create major psychological uh, effects because they can use social media and the public's dependence on social media to magnify the cognitive effects above all the fear and sense of panic that the public will have even from small scale events. And that's a huge advantage, isn't it? Because in a cyber Pearl Harbor, very large scale cyber attack against US or allied infrastructure, well, we're gonna respond with proportionally destructive attacks and schwack the bad guys. If they can conduct very small scale limited attacks and get the psychological benefits they see by using information operations, that's a win for them. And much more difficult for us to counter. Next slide, please. So here's what we need. First of all, a defensive strategy that understands that we've got day-to-day -day information operations, but we need to be ready for edge of war crises. And then if cyber attacks begin, those information operations are gonna continue. We need to be able to defend from peacetime through the beginning of war against information operations. We above all need to get ready for what I call the dark gray zone. Everybody online today is familiar with the gray zone, that area between peace and war that we're in today. But when we get to an edge of war situation, the public is much more sensitive to online messaging for reasons I'll talk about. We need to get ready for edge of war situations. And then of course, what the Russians call the initial period of conflict, where they'll try to prevail right away at the lowest possible cost to themselves and get us to back down. We especially need to prepare for information operations against uh, our coalition defenses. And everybody here online is familiar with Article 5 of the uh, NATO treaty. Collective defense is critical to the future of the West. Adversaries are going to use information operations to target the NATO decision-making process to delay and disrupt our agreement that collective defense is essential. And then finally, we're at risk of having two cylinders of excellence. Over here, we have the beginnings, thanks in part to the work of the Army Cyber Institute, thinking about how we make defenses work against information operations. And over here, we have cyber resilience initiatives to strengthen the protections for the power grid, water systems, et cetera. We've got two separate lines of effort I'm arguing today we need to integrate those efforts because the bad guys are doing that themselves. They're preparing to execute combined information and cyber operations. Our defensive strategies need to account for that joining together of lines of effort. Next slide, please. Here's what I'd like to talk about and tee up for discussion, first of all, by Maggie and Joe, and then by all of you. We have a great opportunity to suppress enemy attacks at their origins. The Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, wherever the Chinese will launch their attacks from, we need to be able to take down the infrastructure and operations as attacks begin. But we're never going to achieve perfect attack suppression. There's always going to be messaging that leaks through. We need to be able to block that coercive messaging stop those IOs from reaching the American people and allied publics. 
while still upholding the First Amendment. Not an easy thing to do, but we'll talk about some options today. Then we need to prepare for effective counter messaging. We've got to be able to make sure that the American people will listen to the president, take his views into account, even though 40% approximately of the American people don't think Joe Biden is the elected president. Then finally, we need to think about defeating micro-targeted uh, messaging against senior US officials, US officials. Everybody who's sitting in the White House basement in the Situation Room during a crisis, when crisis is intensifying, those folks, their families, they're going to receive specialized, personalized messaging to convince them to yield in the crisis. And then finally, as I mentioned before, we need to strengthen allied coordination, especially under Article 5. Next slide, please. Let's take a step back now and try to uh, get a hold of how the nature of warfare is beginning uh, to change. The US military, and I'll defer to Joe and Maggie on this, uh, it's the military is changing the way we're going to achieve victory in the future. In the past, think back to Desert Storm, we'd physically annihilate Saddam Hussein's forces in the desert. That's how we would win, through physical destruction. Now there's been a significant shift in US military doctrine towards shaping adversary perceptions and behavior, and above all, convincing the adversary to yield when conflict is looming and convince adversaries that they can't win at a price that is acceptable to them. That's what's going on in all of the armed forces U.S. Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Force, 16th Air Force, for example, this shift towards achieving victory in the cognitive realm in conjunction, of course, with other lines of effort, including possibility of cyber operations. And big organizational changes are underway. We can talk about those later. Next slide, please, David. So we're getting ready to conduct information operations and potentially combined information and cyber operations to shift adversary perceptions and behavior so that we can win ideally without firing a shot. And yet somehow we are failing to imagine that adversaries will do, do the same darn thing to us. Uh, and that is especially odd given what we know about Chinese and Russian uh, doctrine. Some of you are familiar with informatized warfare uh, that uh, uh, China is going to conduct against us. And just last week, there's a new document, I have it here, the military and security developments involving the People's Republic of China, new DOD study. China is moving down this path very, very quickly, thanks especially to the applications of artificial intelli intelligence towards being able to shift US perceptions and beliefs in times of crisis. Then in Russia, of course, we have new generation warfare. I hate the phrase, Gerasimov doctrine, goes far beyond one person. But again, coercing enemy decision-making, that's the coin of the realm in Russian doctrine, so that they can win, ideally, at the lowest possible cost to them. Next slide, please. They've got a leg up on us, don't they? First of all, there's been a decades long, multi decades long loss of public trust in federal government in the United States. For a lot of reasons and over three decades now, the American people have lost confidence in their own government. To tell the truth, to be able to source, be a source of critical, credible information and Adversaries now, Russia and China above all, are pouring gasoline on that fire, aren't they? With their ongoing information campaigns to corrode faith in democratic governance. Second, as I mentioned in the introduction, when there is a, a, a stressful event, a severe hurricane, a terrorist attack, such as the Boston uh, Marathon bombings, Americans turn to social media as their source of information. Again, yeah, the bad guys are all about exploiting that dependence. Micro-targeting of social media messaging, 
Every day and every way, China and Russia are scooping up what they can from monitoring social media messaging, stealing data from the Marriott Corporation, all the sensitive information about those who stay at Marriott hotels. The, the list goes on and on. They're gathering this intelligence and thanks to arti artificial intelligence, they're able to make use of this in order to begin micro-targeting uh, social media uh, messaging. And you're all familiar with the rise of deep fakes, now audio fakes, the exploitation of social media algorithms where Facebook makes extra money off of uh, high stress, anxiety producing messaging because we'll stay on longer and click on ads more frequently if they're purveying stressful content. Again, that's uh, wonderful for the adversaries. They love those algorithms and are ready to exploit them. And then, of course, winning and unwitting assistance by, uh, by people inside the fence line, inside our territory, by Americans who retweet propaganda from Russia and China and serve as either knowing or unknowing uh, agents of influence for our adversaries. Next slide. How is the crisis going to evolve? Well, first of all, we're gonna get this chorus of messaging. Uh, adversary is gonna say, hey, American citizens, why should you stand up for a country like Latvia that you can't even find on the map? Why should your families be at risk? Why should you be willing to suffer loss of life, mass casualties in exchange for a NATO ally? So we're gonna get that first. But if IOs prove inadequate, they'll start making good on their threats of punishment. As I said before, I believe they're unlikely to launch an all out cyber attack because we'd launch a proportional response and inflict unacceptable costs on the adversaries. Instead, we're going to face what Alexander George, Thomas Schelling, other theorists of coercion in the Cold War called exemplary strikes. Very small scale, carefully limited attacks to demonstrate adversary capabilities, vividly display, maybe even enhanced with defakes, the amount of suffering that the adversaries have been able to achieve in one particular city, and then send out messaging, hey, you ain't seen nothing that. The same horrors that are being visited upon Seattle or Boston or whatever the city is, that's coming to you next unless you abandon the Baltics or Poland or whatever the target uh, country is. Next slide. Fortunately, we've got a head start in countering these information operations. In the United States, we have programs run by DHS beginnings of programs run by the State Department to help counter uh, foreign influence, to help deal with threats of shaping U.S. electoral outcomes. Everything that we built for day-to-day -day operations, we can put on steroids to get ready for the coercive information campaigns to come. But what we have today is nowhere near what we're going to need in a severe crisis. We need to understand, we need to develop a threat assessment of what those coercive operations are going to look like. And we're, we're beginning to do that today. There's lots more we can talk about, but I think the most important thing we can do as a next step is collectively, including within the NATO environment, begin to understand, okay, here's examples of how information warfare went forward in Russia's invasion of Ukraine, hybrid war, for example. Here's what it's gonna look like using much more sophisticated tactics, technologies, and procedures in a genuine edge of war crisis. And we need to, again, think about not just only peacetime operations, but edge of war and into the beginnings of cyber attacks on critical infrastructure. And we need to get rolling right away. Next slide, please. So how do we get rolling right away? We need to be able to suppress attacks where adversaries are launching them on adversary territory. According to press accounts in the Washington Post, which many of you have seen, 
prior to the 2018 elections in the United States, U.S. Cyber Command used its capabilities to disrupt the infrastructure and operations of Russia's Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg to prevent the IRA from launching imminent attacks to shape and influence and disrupt that U.S. election. Well, geez, we've got these capabilities for suppression. We've used them before, according to press accounts. Let's begin to adapt those. Let's ramp them up for use to suppress information operations in a severe crisis. But something's still gonna get through. We're gonna have leakers, right? Attack suppression is never gonna be 100% perfect. And so let's get ready for the leakers. And above all, Russia and to a lesser extent, China, they're now using infrastructure inside the United States, servers, everything else, on US territory, assembling botnets of US computers to conduct information operations against America from inside our own borders. So we're gonna need more than attack suppression, right? We're gonna need the ability to handle information operations that despite our best efforts, get through. Next, please. So what do we do? Well, uh, borrowing from Georgia Orwell, of course, we could always establish a ministry of truth. I don't think that's a great idea. And in fact, doing so, uh, backing away from our commitment to freedom of speech, that gives the bad guys a win. The very last thing we want to do is to mimic the uh, treatment of our citizens that Xi Jinping and Putin do today. We need to stand up for the Constitution, not begin to nibble away at it. There have been Supreme Court rulings, including Lamont and others, that have reiterated that American people have the right to access foreign propaganda. The US government can't block foreign propaganda, no, no matter how hateful, evil, and disruptive that it is, according to these Supreme Court uh, rulings. But uh, the president has emergency powers under the Communications Act that, were, that was enacted right after Pearl Harbor, never applied to this kind of scenario. There may be ways that we can build out the potential use of those authorities in extremis. When the president declares an emergency, we need to figure out, okay, does this apply to social media, which of course didn't exist after Pearl Harbor, and develop plans, capabilities, and exercises to use these emergency powers, only in those extreme circumstances, not in the day-to-day -day environment in which we operate today. Next slide. We also need to collaborate with social media companies in order to block a course of IOs. Now, I know that this is gonna to be tough. Everybody's been reading the uh, 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 leak documents from Facebook, watching the congressional testimony about the degree to which the whole business plan of Facebook and other social media platforms depends on sending out inflammatory and potentially Russian and Chinese generated messaging. So we'll get all excited and upset, stay on their sites longer and click on their advertising. China and Russia are all about exploiting those algorithms. So <laughs> what I'm saying is, well, let's do something that runs counter to their underlying business models. That's going to be tough. I recognize it. But there are opportunities for progress, and we've got to try. And I think the model for what to do is provided by filtering of child pornography. Social media companies have done a good, although not perfect, job of defining what constitutes child pornography and then developing filtering mechanisms to block that content when it's been identified, adjudicate uncertain uh, uh, examples. Uh, let's do that for coercive messaging. Let's develop a definition of coercive messaging that is narrowly focused, that's tight, that in particular addresses the, uh, the kind of messaging we're gonna get, which is they're gonna threaten us with horrific, punishment, primarily via cyber attacks, that uh, gives us a starting point to narrowly define uh, the uh, 
coercive messaging to come. And then develop protocols for what we'll do in coordination with social media uh, companies when a crisis occurs. Again, not day to day. This would only be used in extremists. Just break glass, I think, is a great term. Uh, but of course, anything that you don't exercise isn't real. So that would be an important component of moving forward. Next slide, please. That's it. I want to thank you all today. I've opened the door to discussions of how micro-targeted uh, messaging, including to US military officers, such as the one online today, can help accomplish adversary goals, goals. Uh, I've talked a little bit about how NATO needs to go forward to strengthen its decision-making processes and procedures under Article 5. There's lots more to talk about, but now we at least have a shared foundation uh, for discussion. And I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues now for their thoughts and uh, disagreements with what I've said uh, so we can move forward together. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, Dr. Maggie Smith, over to you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here. And before I begin, I have to give my blanket disclaimer stating that the opinions that I express and the information and ideas that I deliver today are mine and mine alone. They're not the Army Cyber Institutes, they're not the United States Armies, and they're not West Point. Um, and now I get to go back to Dr. Stockton's um, amazing paper. I really enjoyed this piece. I think it's such a long form um, narrative that really spells out and includes some really awesome historical nuggets that we can build on. And it actually puts forth a way to act to begin the conversation around these really complicated, often contentious problems that involve the information environment and what individuals think. And to begin my comments, I turn back to one of Dr. Stockton's first comments is like, how do we actually play defense in the dark gray zone while also ensuring that we're protecting the US constitution? And because we always are concerned with free speech and enabling free speech in a democracy, one that is destined and desires to maintain that transparency within the government, as well as the way that government conducts its activities as it relates to the public. Um, there are some examples, I think, that can help inform how we go about this that aren't mentioned in this piece, but I think can be really brought in and studied to give potential ways forward to evaluate how when we're operating in a contested environment and the decision makers are also being micro-targeted by our adversaries to influence their capacity to make decisions. I think we can potentially look at how people respond to and act in hostage and high crisis situations like hostage situations. So turning to the interactions with both law enforcement and hostage takers, as well as the family members who are deeply invested and concerned about the outcome of those types of events. Of course, that's not a complete or an even perfect type of analogy to make, but I think the high stakes that are concerned, and we can imagine that our adversaries may micro-target specific decision makers with holding information that's personal or holding people that mean a lot to that decision maker at risk is potentially one way to help shape the decision environment around high crisis situations. So I think bringing in that literature may be able to help inform us on how individuals may respond cognitively to high stress situations when things that they hold important are taken at risk. And the other one is touched upon, and I want to expand on it because I do think it's critical. We know a lot, especially because social media has enabled us to be able to collect data and assess the information environment immediately following a act of terrorist violence or a violent act that has taken place on domestic soil. So um, Dr. Stockton brought up the bombing in 2013 at the finish line of the Boston Marathon we are able to see how public opinion and how myths and disinformation surrounding the event spread on social media because we're able to go back and access that data and to be able to then conduct analysis on it. And so we are able to kind of see that how it fans out from the immediate epicenter of an event. And so if we're able to 
understand that and assess how gray, dark gray zone activities and how significant events happening against US and domestic infrastructure, then potentially we can assess what areas we need to focus on when we're concentrating targeted messaging to help inform the general public of actions they should take in the event of a crisis or how dis and misinformation tends to spread between different online communities in response to a terrorist event can help inform us how it may, um, those same, so same types of communities may respond to an act of aggression from a foreign nation state. I think that is a critical analogy that Dr. Stockton draws into his analysis, but is something that really help, can help us determine the information flow that spreads out from the epicenter of an attack on our homeland. The other thing that I think we still are struggling to define in the United States, and I love Dr. Stockton's assessment that we just need to get started. We've only started scratching the surface by beginning engaging in conversation. But I think something we need to identify and do quickly is uh, who is actually responsible for these activities. We don't have a single entity that is the owner of the problem set. It's that's something that um, Major Littell brought up yesterday when we were having conversations about this. But if we are going to attack this problem, then we need to identify who is actually going to be the coordinator of this problem set. Who is the, the entity that is going to provide the verified and truthful information that we can disseminate to the United States public? Um, because otherwise we're at risk of having multiple focal points for information that may not necessarily, especially in a contested information environment, be coordinated and be providing the same types of information to different populations and segments of the American people. So the risk of war is obviously greater when we have these high stakes of, um, events happen and when we have um, coordinated attacks, especially, because if we have a kinetic and a cyber attack happening in a coordinated fashion, then that not only attacks our cognitive ability to assess the situation, but it also attacks the infrastructure that we are able to use for command and control. So these are types of uh, events that Dr. Stockton is looking at that would cause high stress to the American public and high stress to those decision makers. And that's what really gets me nervous about this situation. Is not only is it the American public that could be under attack in the cognitive domain, but it's also the decision makers that are gonna be taking action and are intended to be the ones that are to protect the American public from further harm. The other thing that I find really fascinating about this problem set is how, how we place this in um, a collaborative environment with the social media companies and how we view their role in this entire um, problem set. And I think Dr. Stockton did a great job of bringing up the difficulty in placing trust in social media companies to come voluntarily forward to participate in any collective or whole of society response in a manner that's actually for the public good and not for their bottom line. And I think that's a challenge that nobody has a good answer to at this stage. We've obviously seen Mark Zuckerberg and the other social media titans testify before Congress saying that they have the public's best interest at heart. But we also see leaked information about the deleterious effects of social media and those platforms that they can have on sectors of our American population, as well as the global population, like teenage girls, for example, as has been identified with Instagram and Facebook. So I think that's one area where we do really have to focus on understanding what regulations may be effective to help social media companies collaborate when we are in a crisis situation across platforms, even when they have competing business interests, and when it is necessary for the president to intervene and establish a baseline of information to be provided, information to be blocked, information to be um, suppressed, as well as information to be physically and logically removed from those websites and platforms to ensure that the public's best interest is really what is being upheld in a crisis situation. Um, again, I think this report and this piece is filled with 
a ton of amazing insights into the nature of the problem in a centralized location. So you can really assess from front to bottom doing really good linear learning on the information operations problem set. And so I am very grateful that Dr. Stockton took the time and did the research to put this together. It's something I'm going to rely on in the future and get my students to read as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Major Joe Lapel for his comments. Thank you, Maggie. And thank you again for having me here, everyone. <clears throat> I also have to do the disclaimer of all the things that I'm about to say are my opinion and do not represent uh, the Army, ACI, or West Point. With that being said, uh, I also agree with many of the things that Dr. Stockton put forward, but since Maggie was very agreeable, I'll do the contrarian effect and say a couple of places where I think potentially we could improve some of the things that were put forth. So one of them, uh, most key to me, is the pro or the reactive stance of counter messaging. There have been numerous studies, one probably seen by many of us um, from Deb Roy out of MIT, that fake news or false stories, false narratives travel around six times faster than truth and um, from traditional news sources and mediums. Uh, this becomes a very difficult problem when you're trying to counter a message. You're assuming that you are going to A, reach the same people that that false narrative reached, and B, you're going to be able to convince them that that was false in the first place. People who share false messages tend to have some sort of preconceived bias that allowed them to pick it up in the first place and allowed it to resonate with them. For me, I always keep a mental model for influence operations and for information operations that are corrosive or malign or however you want to define them as there's kind of three things you can uh, attack, right? You have the, the man, and I use that term universally, so the man or the woman, um, both individually and as a social group. We all have beliefs, values, preconceived biases, fears, all these things that play into how we perceive our world around us. And that can be individually or that can be at a group level. If you're, you know, I saw someone put in the chat about QAnon. QAnon has its very specific uh, belief structure, which shapes how they have their worldview. The next thing is the message itself. Um, in many works, it's referred to as narrative warfare. It's these deep stories that affect people based off of their worldview. There are things that have been around for a long time that have been built upon. So uh, I, I find QAnon fascinating, so I'll keep along that, um, that strain. A lot of what QAnon has built off of is anti-Semitic, um, you know, blood rights from the um, medieval times, right? That Jews were going around and capturing Christian babies in Slavic nations and doing blood rituals to stay forever young and gain power right? This crazy idea. But if you followed anything with QAnon, there's this idea that the elites are doing something similar to stay young. Those in Hollywood and um, the liberals and leftists in the United States or in around the world have this secret cabal that controls the world. So you have the message. The other part of it is the medium, which I think we focus pretty heavily on in a lot of Dr. Stockton's work of that algorithmic confounding, these emergent technologies like um, deep fakes and um, things of that nature that will affect how things are um, pushed to individuals. And each one of these can be affected differently. So if we talk about trying to counter them, they're going to each be a different type of countering. So you have to understand what people's beliefs and biases are if we're going to go directly to a group of people or the people. We have to understand those deep line narratives in order to counteract any effect that Russia or China might use to essentially take those narratives and use them as their own for their own national security or political objectives. And finally, the, the mechanics of using recommendation, excuse me, recommendation algorithms against ourselves or using deep fakes to blur the lines of what is truthful and what is fake um, are definitely going to change. Uh, one thing that there has been some studying on is the effects of various moderation from everything from like soft moderation, like we saw with COVID where um, Twitter would have a light um, panel over a meme that was shared saying, this is probably not correct. You should go to NHS or CDC or whoever and look up the real statistics for this. Um, we've seen more hardcore deplatforming um, in the case of former US President Donald J. Trump. He was deplatformed from multiple different um, places to include Facebook and Twitter. Um, 
And while that has certain effects on the ability to spread information, especially when you talk about information laundering, where um, useful people in the United States who have big followings may take a piece of coercive IO from China or Russia and spread it to a greater masses by removing them from that cog in the machine, they're not able to spread it as far. Um, I believe there's a signal report following um, President Trump's, or excuse me, former President Trump's removal from uh, Twitter that disinformation around the election dropped something like 75 or 76 percent in a day. Um, the other side of that is China and Russia don't care about being deplatformed. They assume that their bots and their sock puppets and all their different accounts are going to be deplatformed. They just need to set the seed. And once the seed is going, the natural forces within those algorithms, within social media as a whole, will push it forward and it will spread it to these people that we as you know the truth tellers or the government as the truth teller, if we're assuming that's the case, um, will not have the same reach that that original you know, seed pushed in will have. And with that, because of people's preconceived biases and their uh, notions and worldviews, some people will be very susceptible to certain types of um, information and some people will not. Um, I always like to say everyone's susceptible to something. You just have to find the right narrative cord to uh, influence them. So in the United States, we have a very um, strong looking at, you know, far right conservative movements, white supremacist groups as being, you know, what Americans can be um, influenced by. But there is a chance if, you know, our adversaries wanted to push the far left, they could potentially do the same thing. They would just have to use different narratives to do it. And that's to say that a narrative singularly can be used um, or be viewed by different groups. We were talking about uh, narratives against the military recently here at work and the idea of being left behind, which is a long standing um, narrative within US military culture, specifically around Vietnam, right? The Vietnam troops were left to dry. They didn't do everything to fight. The government didn't do everything to fight the war and they were left behind and left to suffer. And then once they got home, they were left behind and were you know, recognized for their sacrifice. Well, that works in certain pops of populations of the government, but it doesn't work in others. If say you're a woman serving in the military, maybe sexual assault is your being left behind. You weren't protected by those who um, were supposed to protect you. you. You weren't one of those individuals that was necessarily a part of the in-group and therefore you were left behind. Uh, same thing with people of color. The U.S. Army has had a history, well, I should say the U.S. military has had a history of treating um, people of color very differently than um, white service members, specifically looking back to World War II. Uh, there was segregation in groups and units that had higher predominance of a specific minority might have seen more combat than others uh, based on being seen as expendable. When they returned home, the GI Bill wasn't given to um, African-Americans the same way it was done for um, white service members. So there's a lot of things that this one single narrative is overarching, but it means very different things to different people. And I think that that's a big key on how we defeat this is, well, what narratives are there? How do they affect them? Because that's what our adversary is looking for. Our adversary is looking for those um, wedges in between our society. They want to expand them because that disarray that as uh, Dr. Stockton alluded to, you know, very few people, or not very few people, very large amount of people, around 40% of people don't think Biden is the legitimate president. That is a huge thing if we would have to go to war to defend one of our allies. Um, are people going to actually put the full force of the US government, you know, on their backs and say, yes, I will happily sign up or have my child sign up to defend um, one of our allies or to defend this country? And that's a huge problem if half the country says, no, I'd rather just see this guy fail when you know it's actually their livelihood just as online as someone who has a different political opinion. And I think that those are some things that we have to potentially think about when we start deciding what is the best way to counteract um, these, um, these malign coercive IOs. I think I've taken over my time, so I'll stop there for the general discussion, give it back to Dr. Gio. All right, well, thanks both to uh, Joe and Maggie for some useful and constructive feedback uh, for, for Paul. So uh, Paul, I saw you uh, assiduously taking some notes there.
Uh, would you like to take a couple of minutes and uh, and respond? And uh, maybe while you're doing that, if I could, I do see one question in the chat. But if I could start to invite folks to uh, to to drop some questions in the chat, we can uh, start to broaden it out uh, in the next couple of minutes after Paul is done uh, with his response. So over to you, Paul. Uh, Paul, you're, you're muted. There we go. Uh, thanks. I was uh, taking notes like a maniac because there was so much great information that Maggie and Joe shared, including uh, things that I had not known. Let me uh, follow up with two questions uh, to them uh, based on uh, their uh, excellent comments. Maggie, it, it seems to me, based on your uh, analysis, that for counter messaging to be effective, we might need to do the same kind of micro targeting that adversaries are going to do to us. That is rather than spam out generalized messaging from the president or whoever to American citizens, we might need to have already understood the kinds of messaging and the way of framing it that will resonate with individual consumers of social media. Uh, I can understand why that's a good thing, but how would you collect uh, information? I don't want to use the intelligence word, but information on American citizens uh, in terms of their proclivities, their biases, their as the as Joe would say, their the narratives that uh, they would uh, be vulnerable to, without getting into deep, deep hot water of U.S. government collecting information. Uh, against its own citizens. That makes me ultra nervous. Um, so my immediate response is that, you know, in our domain um, and Major Littell and I have experienced this, but there are definitely barriers to doing any of that, um, especially as a US government um, service member uh, in terms of collecting information on our own um, people. Now, my counter to that is it's already being done. Um, our advertisement agencies and um, you know those big data aggregation companies that are essentially these data warehouses on the American public and our, our propensities for certain you know things on Amazon over another. Um, the other partnership that you bring up in your paper that we haven't discussed yet is actually developing a partnership with those legitimate news and media um, outlets that already exist. And so I think immediately that is one avenue where the US government could partner with an already established media organization in order to deliver information that has been verified and trusted from an original source, meaning the US government, and have those media organizations compelled to deliver that message to the person that are most likely to be watching or tuning in or reading um, the news on their site. Of course, that has to imply or almost imply that those media organizations have to be willing to partner with the US government and make that partnership known that in the event that there is a crisis, we are going to be delivering information and we have to do it in the manner that the United States government is asking us to do so. But oftentimes we've seen and research shows that if a person hears something from a news source or an opinion source that they trust, that they are going to be more likely to tune in and listen to them in the event that they're asked to do something in a crisis information situation. Um, so I think that could be one area where a partnership is developed or where that notion that you have in your paper of partnering with established media outlets can be furthered to also be the people and the organizations that are um, collaborating with the US government to disseminate information in the event of uh, a crisis situation where uh, the information environment is contested. That's great. And then Joe, you raise an incredibly important point uh, on the difficulty of counter messaging. And that is once the a false narrative has taken hold, uh, that is compelling and very hard to overcome. In, in my paper, I talk a little bit about the first mover advantage. It's almost like a first strike advantage in the nuclear realm. 
once people have lodged within their brains a false narrative, it's very difficult to dislodge that false belief, even when you confront people with evidence that their beliefs are wrong. Would you recommend, again, speaking as a private citizen here, that uh, we think about preemptive messaging very early in a crisis that rather than giving Xi Jinping uh, the opportunity to shape the narrative by going first, maybe the president should go first and early on begin making the case for why we ought to, to defend our NATO allies or whoever the victim of any aggression is. So yes, I am very much an advocate for a proactive approach to information operations and influence operations. Uh, you touched on the lack of trust, and I think that is a huge problem with um, much of this. However, I think we can always assume what our adversaries are going to go at and what attacks they're going to make prior to them making them. So if we can get out ahead of that, it makes it less salient when it actually does hit the, the forum that they're pushing it on, right? So if we're saying we're going to defend Taiwan, and again, this is my opinion, this is not U.S. military. If we're going to depend, defend Taiwan at all costs, if there is a level of transparency by the U.S. government saying this is what the cost is and this is what we can assume will happen and that is what happens, there is a level of trust that will be built off of that that we can um, go forward to protect ourselves essentially against what our adversaries will do. Now, the problem is, is in these lighter points um, and when people's own um, political ventures domestically are put on um, on the line, they are less likely to be transparent. Um, and that's just human nature, right? We will always want to protect ourselves. However, I think the more transparent and the more proactive we are, the better we are in that realm because there's no vacuum for our adversary to fill. We're already there. They have to now beat our narrative. And obviously there's always going to be conspiracy theorists who say, oh, well, they're still lying to you. Yes, we'll never get that crazy 10% away from it. But if we can get you know 90% of the population understanding what the truth is and what our intent is, then we will do better. But we have to, again, there's the narrative of the government lying to you from God knows how long, You know, as long as there has been a federal government. And especially in the last 20 years with some of our um, military quote unquote adventures uh, we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan. They may not have started on truthful notes, um, all of them. So there's that overcoming that to make someone believe what we're doing militarily is needed and isn't um, something beyond, beyond some political move. Okay, uh, Paul, did you wanna respond further or should we uh, proceed? Uh, I'd say let's proceed, but uh, both of those responses were rich in terms of potential policy recommendations, and uh, I'm going to capture that in, in my future research. Really very valuable comments. Thank you. All right. Um, well, the first question, I have, it's a little bit of an eye chart here, so if you excuse me, uh, is from Andre. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Would the counter misinformation doctrine that is aimed at foreign adversaries be applied to domestic misinformation efforts, such as QAnon, which are often equally as potent in sowing discord in our country? Um, yeah, I, I can only foot stomp that, that question, right? You know, and I think we, we sort of even spoke about that, Paul, a little bit yesterday, right? You know, how do you, how do you, how do you disentangle uh, the domestic from the foreign? And oftentimes those seem to be code for you know, illegitimate versus legitimate when, when we use those, those boundary sorts of, of frameworks. Uh, over to you, Paul. It's, it's a great question, but I want to go back to the distinction that I raised earlier that is very, very important going forward from a policy perspective. We do have QAnon. We have efforts to sow discord in our country. Folks, that constitutes preparing the cognitive battlefield for future coercive operations. They are distinct and they're gonna require different kinds of policy approaches. We are getting social divisions, sure, and adversaries are trying to widen them every day. That provides the basis later in a crisis to call into question US policy, to mobilize pundits and 
Fox News or MSNBC, whatever you, you think is appropriate, to mobilize members of Congress, to get to their staffs, their political donors, everything that the bad guys are doing now to sow discord, that improves the terrain on which they'll conduct coercive information operations when they threaten us with horrific punishment. And then most important, we haven't talked enough today, begin to inflict that punishment, begin to take down power and water systems in the United States. Okay, uh, thanks for that. We, uh, we do have some questions coming in. Uh, Paul, I'm gonna read two of them at the same time from the same questioner. Uh, and maybe you can, uh, if you want to answer both, uh, feel free, or you can choose one. Uh, first question from Seb. Uh, if we need to contest adversarial information operations, how do we do this if they're taking place in the population or cognitive domain of allies and partners? On what legal basis can we do this? Uh, so that's question one. Question two fully agreed with targeting the infrastructure of information operations, but how do we stop the quote unquote patriotic practitioner or social media influencer that is conducting uh, IOs not as the, uh, uh, at the behest of a nation state? I mean, uh, for example, ISIS, although I, I wonder if the, the Russian patriotic hacker might be the the, the, the broader example of the phenomenon. Uh, so let me pause there, uh, Paul, and, and turn that back over to you. Sure, I'm gonna tackle question number one and then turn over question number two to Maggie and Joe. On, on question number one, uh, the uh, allied and partnership issue is uh, highlighting, Seb, the importance of working these issues through NATO and our East Asian uh, alliance relationships as a, a form of coalition preparedness. There is no way we can tackle as the United States government the sovereign responsibilities of our NATO allies and other security partners. We need to agree in advance how we're going to proceed against IOs. And again, today, Russia is preparing the battlefield by messaging every day to weaken allied cohesion. Every day there's messaging to play divide and rule in NATO. That gets them ready to disrupt Article 5 decision making. This has to be done as part of a NATO operation and equivalent operations with our allies in Asia. So let's get rolling on that. This is not, repeat, not a U.S. only effort. It's going to require genuine deep partnerships in areas where we've just barely begun to tackle a problem of coercive operations as opposed to day-to-day -to -day Chinese and Russian messaging. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, Maggie and Joe, you can probably see the, the chat uh, question as well. Yeah. Either, Maggie, you're, you're un unmuted. You wanna go first? Sure. Um, so to the first point, I think um, when we think domestically, so the United States Army has been working through kind of a, a very similar question about you know what is our role in information operations against the American population and I think one of the mechanisms that we have that's already established and has legal authority is our public affairs officers and those are the ones that are really kind of the, the mouthpiece of of the military but it's increasingly being noted that they play a large role in this whole kind of um, 365 degree conception of what the information environment and how it's able to be used uh, for offensive military operations and the role that the PAO or the public affairs officer plays in presenting verified and factual information in an official capacity. So legally, that's part of informing and educating um, the domestic population. And that also in many ways translates to our areas of operation globally. There's a public affairs um, element to international operations. Um, so that's another um, kind of bullet point to what Dr. Stockton was saying about NATO. And then on the second point, um, it's mentioned in Dr. Stockton's paper, but Joint Task Force Ares was established within um, Army Cyber Command and the Cyber National Mission Force and US Cyber Command in order to take a look at and uh, tackle the problem of the Islamic State in um, the information domain. 
as well as the cyber domain. And I think part of the way that nation states um, or the difficulty of, of attacking information operations and IOs that are coming from nation states is that most of the time, especially when we're dealing with Russia and China, we're dealing with a near peer um, adversary. And that means that we're really trying to keep everything below the threshold of war. So in many cases, our information operations, as well as our cyberspace operations, are really used as signaling events uh, to express dissatisfaction with the current policy or things like that. But when we talk about a non-nation state actor, someone that's a terrorist or an external organization that is a rogue entity within the domain, like the Islamic State, then um, there's the ability to actually conduct coordinated offensive actions against those entities. So, so things that happen in and through cyberspace, but then also in and through the cognitive domain and the information domain um, writ large. So I think um, we have a lot of MJTF areas um, or Joint Task Force areas is really a test case for this, but there are mechanisms within U.S. Cyber Command uh, and the elements that are under the control of uh, General Noxoni as the commander that are able to leverage a lot of different assets to tackle the information operations as well as cyberspace operations of non-nation state actors. Um, but it is different than when we're thinking about a nation state, simply because the outcomes um, and the desires that we have in terms of our intent behind these operations are different. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Major Lapel. So I wanna to touch on the first one a little bit more on the ally side. So I, full disclosure, I'm a psychological operations officer and um, typically in USASOC, but I'm up here at ACI right now, or Army Cyber Institute. Um, so we do the joint uh, training exchanges with various partners across the world on what is and isn't information operations and what is and isn't psychological operations and how to best defend against that depending on the nation state. We also have numerous um, uh, liaisons with different government agencies within our allied and partner forces that allow us to have that partnership there. So if we needed to do something within a country that, you know, say we're in the Baltics and they are pushing some sort of messaging against us, we have that relationship already built up with those various nations and we can go to them and say, hey, this is happening. Can you leverage your forces to make this stop happening as a you know, favor to us or whatever as our partner? So that is part of how we handle things that are happening outside of the United States in one of our allied forces um, countries. Uh, with the about the infrastructure for the patient practitioners or the ISIS, uh, I think Maggie really covered ISIS well. We have a lot more authorities when it's a foreign adversary, even if it's not a traditional nation state on what we can and cannot um, do. However, once you start getting into a domestic actor, you know whether you wanna call them like a useful idiot passing along information or they're actually well tied into a nation um, state for whatever way, there are very strict laws on what we can do, and rightfully so, right? We don't want to hinder our First Amendment rights of our citizens. Um, it really depends on how and the way those connections are made, if that makes sense. So if someone's on the payroll for Russia, it becomes something very different than if they're just spreading Russian um, propaganda on their own. They believe it fully, but they have no real ties to Russia, right? We, we would never be able to stop that unless they go to the like realm of, you know, threats of physical violence and breaking um, terms of service and whatever on that, whatever social media platform they are. But we're not going to be able to arrest them for speaking their mind or speaking their place. If they're a Russian asset, then you start getting into the idea of, um, are they disclosing that? You have to do foreign disclosures if you're working for a foreign government on their behalf, things of that nature, which we've seen come up over the last couple of years with a couple of people who've been arrested in conjunction with the Russia collusion. Um, so that answers that as best as I think I can within this forum. And I just okay. add uh, one thing there. Uh, Maggie uh, pointed out accurately that concerns over escalation are uh, uh, paramount with uh, nuclear powers like Russia and China. 
but they're going to try to maneuver around our uh, existing nuclear and kinetic uh, capabilities to prevail in a crisis. And let me read to you from the uh, DOD assessment of chi the Chinese military that came out last week. The People's Liberation Army judges that aggressive asymmetric actions against perceived U.S. political, military, and psychological weaknesses are effective counterbalances to U.S. military superiority in traditional domains. Let's stop thinking exclusively about A2D2 and how many carriers can dance on the head of a pin and get ready for them to hit us where we ain't. Uh, thanks for that, uh, all three of you. Um, I'm gonna just cherry pick a couple questions uh, here now. I'm gonna start with Jim. Uh, is there evidence of overt or covert collusion between Russia and China in influence operations that are ongoing against the West. And if I can just sort of maybe put a little spin on that, uh, I wanna put this in the, in the framework of, of you know, so-called great power competition and now everything has suddenly become Russia and China, uh, but they're very different creatures uh, and they're different in cyberspace and they're different in their intelligence uh, you know, posture against the West and, and on and on. And yet we sort of keep lumping them in the same bucket. Um, and I wonder, you know, do they interact at all? I guess maybe the question, if I've understood it right, do they interact at all synergistically? Or, you know, do they piggyback on each other? Or are these just attacks, one's coming from the east and one's coming from the farther east? Uh, or is there, is there more to it than that? Uh, over to you, Paul. Uh, David, uh, no fair handing me that hand grenade. Uh, I'm going to ask you to provide an answer. You know much more about great power competition than I do, and I'd very much be interested in your thoughts. Well, that's totally not fair. I'm here to moderate. Um, I can answer if you guys want. Oh, I have okay. an answer to that. Yeah, okay. Let, let, me, let me let Joe uh, go. go over my career. I'll, I'll, Don't worry. I won't totally punt. I'll formulate some thoughts. Uh, over to you, Joe. So over covert collusion between Russia and China and influence operations, I would say that it's more on that synergistic level that Dr. Gio alluded to. Um, we saw with COVID, uh, some of the same themes and narratives that were being used were being used by both countries and it was to attack the West, particularly in our inability to control the virus and the pandemic. However, we know that that's not truthful because we were honestly reporting our number of cases and our number of deaths where Russia and China were hindering um, what was being reported, right? Um, same thing with the anti-vax movement. Both countries have um, had attacks against our vaccines, which we've seen have major problems with getting our populace fully protected um, from the virus. So I think there's definitely a synergy as in a true connection. One, I don't know if this is the forum to really get into that. And two, I don't necessarily, to go back to what Dr. Gio said, they have different goals, right? China wants to be the sole superpower and Russia wants to get what they can, right? And they go about their information operations in very similar yet very different ways because their ultimate end goal is going to be different, right? Russia wants their piece of the pie. They don't necessarily want to be the sole superpower, whereas China has been, you know, from their view, emasculated for centuries by the West and they want to be respected and they want to be the sole, you know, superpower within the world above the United States, where they are looked upon with, you know, prestige and pride, and much of what they're communicating to the West through their three warfares, which is, you know, the public opinion warfare, psychological warfare, and legal warfare, um, is basically pushing that goal, right, to become the sole superpower. And because of that, their paths may cross because they have beneficial means to it, but I don't think that they're necessarily trying to work together because China doesn't want Russia to be on their same level. They want to be higher than Russia, right? So there's no reason for them to synergize unless it really, um, the paths cross in that specific spot. I have opinions, can I say too? Yeah, please go, Maggie. Right. So um, I love this example and it came out a little while ago, but um, recently on a Russian language forum, it was found that China had put a message or had socialized the story um, in Russian language um, that 
the COVID-19 virus was really uh, developed and was released from Fort Detrick in Maryland, which should sound familiar because Active Measures, uh, the book by Thomas Ridd lays out Operation Infection, which was a Soviet um, effort to socialize that the AIDS virus was created by the US Army at Fort Detrick in Maryland. So it's interesting to see China now taking kind of a playbook or a page out of the Russian playbook and trying to get Russian speaking forums to start socializing a story of that the US created um, the COVID-19 virus. And Major Littell made some really interesting or good points about the, the aims of both countries. And when we think about China, it's a, it's, it has this long legacy of this amazing civilization that's over 3000 years old. And Russia also dates back well before the United States. Um, and one thing that's fascinating about China is that they're not only interested in this information domain, but they're also really dedicated to um, their Belt and Road Initiative, which is developing infrastructure in um, Africa and underdeveloped areas, which then gives them access to these massive data sets and these massive populations because um, one of their stated goals from their 2019, um, some of the releases that they made about policy in 2017, excuse me, um, is that they want to become the leader in AI and artificial intelligence technology. And so the cultural aspect that China is attempting to really culturally influence globally um, the way the world actually functions, the way that infrastructure is built and the way that we communicate with each other, I think is an important distinction between uh, Russia and China because Confucius centers are popping up all over South and Central America, as well as within Africa. When China builds infrastructure for you, they not only um, implant or you know um, import the infrastructure, but they also import labor. They bring Chinese natives and nationals to build and be the ones that are monitoring and developing that infrastructure for you. And so the cultural aspect, I think, is really strong with China. Um, but they do definitely play on the same types of themes, the same discord um, narratives that we see Russia being on both sides of in the United States, for example, like the pro-police movement and Black Lives, Matter move, Black Lives Matter, excuse me, movement are two areas that Russia latched onto on both sides where we have pro-gun control and um, pro-First Second Amendment or NRA type narratives. Uh, we see China there as well. Um, and I think it's important to add that even though we focus great power competition on Russia and China primarily, in part because of their size and their um, economic powers as well, but um, the middle powers or those like India, your Iran and um, North Korea are also play a critical role. And in many cases, Iran and North Korea pay back on some of the initiatives that China and Russia do. But I do think the distinct focus of each of their ability or what they're really going for in the information space is different. Russia is really just trying to be disruptive, whereas China is really trying to ensure that the Chinese people and the Chinese kind of brand name um, are well respected within the international community, because instead of having an Americanized world, they want a Chinese world. And then um, back home, they're really invested in creating a narrative that um, focuses on the party and adherence to this great notion that China is really this ancient civilization that should be at the forefront of the globe. But it's a fascinating problem set. And I think it's um, something to wake up in the morning to study every day. <laughs> well, I'm glad that I, uh, I, I went last. Uh, it gave me a, a second to, to learn from my colleagues. And I don't think I can improve upon that, but. Uh, to not totally punt, I think what I would simply add is that I think Russia, I, first of all, I don't think there's any coordination going on in terms of, you know, at the whiteboard, you know, hey, what messages are we going to put out? So I think these things start to I interact, as Joe said, uh, synergistically once they're out in the wild. Uh, but in terms of, you know, placement, seeding, you, you know, message crafting, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think any of that is coordinated. Um, but it, it seems to me, and you know, I, I don't have the evidence to, to sort of back this up yet, it's still something I'm working on, that the, uh, the Russians surprised themselves 
with how vulnerable America was to influence operations, even before the 2016 election. And I, I always like to go back uh, to Jade Helm in 2015 as one of my, you know, my, my favorite, you know, the Russians started to play, you know, sort of in this, this alt-right chat universe. And, uh, and I think they, they were just sort of, you know, putting a toe in the water to see whether or not Americans would swallow absolute garbage. Um, and sure enough, we did. And then uh, this is not Dave Geo. This is me quoting uh, General Hayden, uh, who basically said, you know, once once the Russians saw how we reacted uh, to Jade Helm 2015, which in the interest of time, I'll just let folks Google if you're not familiar with it, uh, that they, that's when they decided they could actually play in the big leagues and go uh, uh, interfere in the uh, in the 2016 presidential campaign. The, the Russians have been doing this, you know, since Soviet days, as Maggie mentioned, and, you know, Operation Infection and Fort Detrick and AIDS. And, and they've had, you know, mixed success. I mean, you know, we, we know that one because it's kind of the grand slam of information operations, you know, but they, they struck out a lot as well. Um, but I think that the, the Chinese, I think, learned from the Russians how vulnerable we are and how much like a great white shark will eat a license plate or a tire, you know, like we'll just swallow it and just see what happens. And, uh, you know, and so uh, the Sufan report uh, put out something recently that said, actually, the, the Russians have been eclipsed by the Chinese in sheer volume of, of things that, that, that are coming out. And so I think, unfortunately, you know, we talk a lot about the effects of information operations and how effective is, is this? Can we measure it? And what are the counterfactuals? And, and whether or not it's effective, I believe that the Chinese think it's effective. And so they went all in and they put a lot of chips in this game where they really weren't playing in the same way. So I think the Chinese learned, they, they saw the, the sorts of, I, I, what I would think would be success of the Russian uh, efforts. And then the Chinese said, wow, that works. Uh, and now it's gone. It's almost sort of jumped the shark in a way. Uh, you know, Joe and I were talking earlier today about a, uh, a, a newspaper article where COVID got to China from Maine lobsters and then, and then came back. Um, you know, whether or not the Chinese would have put out something like that, you know, if, if COVID had happened in 2014, let's say, you know, I, I tend to doubt it. I think they were a learning organization and, uh, and now they've, they've learned. Anyway, all right, uh, enough from me. Uh, we have two questions uh, that deal with the role of the private sector, uh, one from Clayton and one from Nick. So I'm just gonna read those uh, as, a, as a pair and then we'll turn it over to whoever wants to take that. Uh, there's a, a mention of, of, of getting the private sector involved in combating information operations from our adversaries. How do we do this to reach a level of effectiveness and how will we know that we've reached a level of proficiency? Uh, and then Nick has specified for Dr. Stockton, the CSAM model, which I'm not exactly sure what that is, uh, relies on voluntary cooperation. As Dr. Smith noted, not all of the relevant companies are based in the US or are willing to cooperate uh, anyway. Uh, if relying on voluntary participation is insufficient and content-based tactics implicate the First Amendment, why not, quote, move up the stack, unquote, and instead target government actions at the economic and profit models that facilitate micro-targeting and information operations? So uh, maybe some, some overlap there. Uh, happy to turn it over to, to Paul for the first whack at it. Yeah. Uh... Great questions. I think that uh, let's start with uh, voluntary measures and C CSAM of the child pornography model is a, a great place to start. But uh, let's be serious here. Uh, Facebook and other media platforms are in a new political environment. There's harsh scrutiny on antitrust measures. There is concern that the business models are inherently, as Maggie said earlier, maybe not in the public interest. And I think the risk of tighter regulation than currently exists, including under the Communications Act, uh, is uh, 
maybe going to provide new inducements for voluntary collaboration. But I think we also need to begin imagining what kind of uh, regulatory and statutory remedies may be appropriate if for some reason we can't make progress on a voluntary basis. And then uh, the next level up, everybody take a look at uh, section 706 of the Communications Act, because if the president declares an emergency, uh, the authorities that she or he can exercise are immense. You can drive a truck through that. So it's not clear exactly how the act applies to social media. Let's get Congress to clarify that in useful ways. So three lines of effort, right? Voluntary collaboration, if necessary, statutory and regulatory initiatives, and then the, uh, uh, if needed, just break glass, emergency powers of the president. Okay, uh, Maggie or Joe, any thoughts on the private sector? I have a similar understanding or belief that he starts small, but eventually we're probably going to have to have some sort of regulation on who is allowed what pieces of our data, right? We've seen this already happening in the EU where they've stricken down and um, gutted a lot of the capabilities of these companies and they still operate there. So it's not necessarily um, hindering their ability to operate. It may be hindering their bottom line, but it's keeping, hopefully, and we're seeing the early portions of it, um, their population a little bit safer from the ability to migrate target, right? Um, when we talk about, you know, scraping, there is a certain amount of information you put out, and you know what you're saying, but there's also a ton of information that's being taken by third parties, cookies, um, sessions data, all these other technologies that allow uh, company to see like how long you have your cursor over an ad, you know, how quickly do you scroll through stuff? Where do you stop? What catches your eye? Um, where does your gaze land? And these are all things that we don't really think about when we're using these, um, these different um, platforms. There's even the side of uh, uh, some social media platforms have what are referred to as ghost accounts, where they create accounts on your behalf based off of people who those algorithms thinks are your real life friends. So maybe you're not on social media, but there's probably still an account somewhere out there that has your information based off of pictures you've been in with uh, you know, friends of yours from college. Maybe you deleted your account and they still have all that data there because you never asked them to actually delete it. There's a lot of things that we have to kind of start thinking about more heavily and start slowly pushing into and thinking of, is this something that needs to be um, left to the provider, or is it something that we as a government need to regulate? Because ultimately, what can be used for advertising can be used by our adversaries to attack us and our democracy. Maggie, did you want to add on to that? Sure, I'll take a different approach because um, Major Littell spelled out a lot of really big concerns I have about the private sector and the economic incentives to like collect all the data and do all of the advertising and get people to consume. Um, something that we haven't talked about, uh, when we truly talk about a kind of 360 degree or whole of society, which is the current buzzword, um, approach to tackling these information and influence operations, um, we don't necessarily put a lot of onus on the, um, the individual. And so I think similar to how, or a lot of equation kind of gets made between, I'm gonna use cybersecurity here, but we could think about information security as well, but a lot of push is put, trying to think about cybersecurity as like a public good, something that if there's a gap in it, then the, the government should step in and solve that problem or provide a service that solves that problem. And when it really comes down to it, and we think about cybersecurity, that's easier to think about than just um, information security or cognitive security. Um, a lot of it relies on like, if I make updates to my phone and if I do things as an individual. And I think we need to start holding individuals accountable for both the way that they, the, the information and their worldview, if that makes any sense. I know that sounds, um, dictatorial or potentially big brother-ish. However, the choices that I make and the information that I ingest, the sites that I go to have an impact on my understanding and my belief system, as well as how I understand my relationship to others, the country that I live in, the government that is that I've signed a social contract with in theory. 
right? And, and all of those relationships are influenced by how I um, understand the world and the activities that are going on around me. And unless we put some onus and unless we invest in educating our youth all the way from kindergarten, all the way up through um, university levels, and having people understand the importance of what's of knowing what their media diet is, of understanding how they make informed decisions throughout the day, the role that social media and these one-liners that we read may translate into physical activities, similar to how when we think about terrorist radicalization, we look for how online activities translate into physical activities. So how does the information we ingest on a regular basis, how does that media diet and our daily media diet um, influence the way that we act and behave as citizens is something that I think deserves more attention and requires some discussion so that we incorporate it into the way that we see ourselves as being good citizens and doing our civic duty that we signed up to as by virtue of getting citizenship and being an American citizen or a global citizen or however we want to define it. So I think that's another area that is understudied, underutilized, and not focused. And I think beginning to define that early in uh, kindergarten education all the way up through and understanding how your role in the information environment as an individual is both critical to our national defense as well as just safety and security of everybody around you is an important connection to draw for people. Well, Maggie, it almost sounds like somebody should write an article giving pride of place to-, uh, uh, to Oh my gosh, is there something coming out of, soon, David? Of, uh, of, of information security as a, and cognitive security as a matter of national defense. Okay, well, uh, we, we won't give that uh, away too much, although uh, I'm getting old waiting for it. Um, okay, well, uh, 87 minutes goes quickly when we're having fun and learning a lot. Um, let me uh, give the uh, last uh, minute or two here back to Paul. Uh, and Paul, what, I, what I'd love you to do is just to, you know, this moves so quickly, you know, and I think historians in particular, like, you know, what do you, what do you mean I wrote it earlier this year? Why does it need to be updated? Um, and so, uh, you know, in this space, you know, with, with every hack or breach or announcement or election or whatever, th things has gone, uh, you know, things have just gone haywire in this space and are moving faster than we can get things written and published. And so um, before I give my final thank yous, Paul, do you just want to uh, take a minute or two and, uh, you know, what, what do you wish, you know, you would have known before you finally just had to, you know, cut off the information and, uh, uh, and, and go to press with what you had as, as a way to just kind of, you know, leave us with the most up-to-date um, the, the most up-to-date uh, uh, perspectives that, that you could offer. So over to you, Paul. And David, I mentioned the a recent analysis by the Pentagon on trends in Chinese exploitation of social media in order to achieve victory without firing a shot, ideally. Uh, what I'd like to urge everybody to do uh, is think about the deterrence realm. Today, we've been focused primarily on how to play defense against information operations. And there's great recommendations that Joe and Maggie have suggested, including greater citizen uh, preparedness. But ideally, we'd like to discourage the uh, Chinese and Russians from ever launching a course of campaign when the balloon finally goes up in the Taiwan Straits. And I'd urge you to think about what role information operations might play in uh, our response capabilities to an impending attack. Right now, we can threaten uh, to use kinetic or even nuclear uh, response options, as well as cyber, to inflict unacceptable costs on adversaries should they attack. What would an information operation look like as an additional arrow in our deterrence quiver in order to uh, uh, discourage information attacks by those who hide behind, who cower in fear behind the great Chinese firewall. Uh, that is a great, uh, great place to end. Uh, let me end on a couple of thank yous as well. I wanted to thank in particular uh, the King's College London communications team, uh, Danny and Lizzie for their help uh, in, in crafting the, uh, the announcement and tech support and all the things that they do uh, behind the scenes.
Um, I wanted to thank the Department of War Studies and the Cybersecurity Research Group in particular, also the Army Cyber Institute at West Point for their partnership here. Uh, of course, our paper author, uh, Paul Stockton, uh, many thanks to you for, uh, for, for uh, getting your ideas on, on paper, on many papers, uh, 212 papers or something like that. Uh, so uh, some, some serious reading. Uh, thanks to Maggie and Joe as well for taking the time to, uh, to, to provide some really good thoughts. Uh, thanks to the British Academy for the Global Professorship Program that uh, lets me be here and, uh, and do these kinds of fun things. Uh, so with that, uh, thanks to all of you uh, in Zoom land and for your good questions. And uh, we will see you next time. Thanks very much out here. Bye-bye.